Hi, my name is Sasha Stoikov, and I'm a senior research associate at Cornell Financial Engineering. And I'd like to tell you about financial data science projects and how they work. First and foremost, these projects involve three stakeholders, um, the company that sponsors the project, a team of four to six students who are going to work on the project for a full semester and, and produce a final presentation and a final report, and a faculty advisor, um, a researcher or professor at Cornell who works on and specializes in this field or in the in the project that is being sponsored. Ultimately, companies uh, can get various things out of these projects. First of all, it allows uh, quants on uh, at um, financial companies to explore promising new areas of research uh, without necessarily um, uh, taking too much risk or, or putting too many resources in these areas. So it's a very exploratory um, kind of project. And it allows them to get sort of like a, a consultant or an outsider perspective on what it is that uh, they're doing. So, of course, this also allows companies to to um, get to know new talent. And this often ends up in uh, a potential hire for companies. And, uh, and finally, it's an opportunity to collaborate with uh, academia and industry. So... Uh, we find that very interesting projects come out of these collaborations. So students, of course, also get a lot out of these projects. They get to apply uh, all the things that they've learned into the real world. They get to participate in research, work in a group. And ultimately, while they're in their final semester looking for, um, for new jobs, um, it helps them to sort of uh, put in perspective the, the skills that they've learned. So um, in order to give you an idea of what these projects are like, I thought I would introduce you to the uh, last year's sponsors. And ultimately, all of them came to us with a question um, in the form of how can we, in other words, uh, typically these, these sponsors have an interesting uh, piece of data or a data set, and they want to achieve a goal and, and usually we try to frame uh, these projects in terms of achievable and deliverable um, goals. So for example, uh, we had Tane at JP Morgan who wanted to uh, use jobs posting data in order to predict uh, the performance of companies. And of course, uh, this was a very novel data set and um, part of the project was to define uh, the key uh, performance indicators that this that um, this kind of data allows one to to uh, predict. Uh, then we had uh, Andrew at the at the Alliance Bernstein who who asked us to analyze text or to use NLP to analyze Chinese news websites in order to predict the performance of China A shares. Uh, we had. Um, Bronca at Odo BHF, who had supply chain data and wanted to predict within groups of stocks um, and which of the stocks will outperform their peers. Uh, we also had Paul at Euronext, who, who asked us how they could match market makers and market takers and FX. And this was a very uh, creative project that involved the recommendation systems. Um, then we had uh, Dark Forests, which is a, a crypto market making uh, fund who asked us um, how they can make markets in crypto with the with latency in mind, because, of course, these exchanges on which crypto is traded are are often far from each other and, and latency can can have an important effect on uh, market making. Uh, then we had Virtu, a, a hedge fund who uh, asked, sometimes the, the projects involve a specific uh, quantitative technique. In this case, it was reinforcement learning. So Virtu asked, how can they use reinforcement learning to hedge their portfolios in FX? And um, the next sponsor was Hedgetech, who asked us how to manage capital across various crypto exchanges to provide quotes uh, to their clients. And so Hedgetech is 
is also a, a crypto market maker. Um, then we had TP at uh, Goldman Sachs who asked us how they can use flows from the past from mutual funds in order to predict the kind of investment projects that um, their marketing department could be suggesting to their clients. Um, and um, then we had Deutsche Bank, um, Blage at Deutsche Bank, who, who asked how uh, regime detection algorithms can be used to uh, construct portfolios. And finally, we had a, another um, crypto startup, Covario, who asked how can um, how can we use crypto order book data in order to predict short-term price moves? So as you can see, there's a huge diversity of, uh, of financial uh, services companies, some that are startups, some that are established large banks. And, um, and ultimately, um, they, they are all asking from our students to, to take a deep dive into these pro pro problems. And uh, finally, to give you an idea of uh, what comes out of these projects, I'd like to share with you a presentation that um, the Covario team uh, gave at the at the end of our semester. We have a little get together where we 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 do a short pitch with all the the highlights of the projects, and their presentation was called "Mind the Gaps: Short Term Crypto Price Prediction." All right. Well. Thank you everyone for coming, um, everyone on Zoom uh, as well. Uh, so the title of our project, we call it Mind the Gap Short-Term Crypto Price Prediction. Um, and yeah, let's get into it. So uh, sort of, I guess the main goal of um, this project was, was laid out clearly kind of in the beginning. So we wanted to seek uh, to construct a robust predictor um, or, or fair price estimators of short-term uh, Bitcoin price prediction. Um, so we, for the data for this, we used three months of uh, high-frequency limit order book data, as well as trades data sourced from uh, Bitstamp. Um, and kind of broad overview of what we did was uh, utilize a bunch of different metrics kind of along the way to evaluate uh, the predictive power of our estimators um, and focusing more on the the one to sixty second uh, kind of time frame, just based on um, kind of what Covario wanted. So first, we kind of talk about uh, these three definitions that we used. Um, we looked at quite a few different signals um, along the way, but I guess these were the three that I guess showed the most validity or we felt the best about moving forward. So first one um, is very similar to what. Uh, um, Professor Stoikoff uh, talks about in his paper on the micro price, um, this kind of quote imbalance adjusted uh, mid price, uh, sort of in a similar vein. We also looked at a trade imbalance uh, adjusted mid price. Um, and then third and final is something that we believe might be sort of a new thing. Uh, we haven't, I guess, found it in other literature, um, but the volume adjusted mid price that we call uh, VAMP. Um, and I, I think it's wise to, I guess, explain that one a little bit. Kind of the way we constructed that was, um, you, first you would set um, a liquidity level. In our case, it was $60,000, but we looked at a bunch of other liquidity levels. And on each side of the book, you would basically go work your way down the book until you hit whatever price where you've cum accumulated that much liquidity. And then on each side, you will take the volume weighted average on each side, and then take the mid price of those two, and that is our VAMP. Hopefully doing a similar thing to what quote imbalance does, right? Um, but one thing I think is worth mentioning is that in a lot of these crypto order books, um, they're not as well behaved, we come to find out, as uh, equity markets, right? Like they're oftentimes huge, huge gaps at the top of the order book. Um, I mean, in oftentimes even $10, $20, like tons of ticks. Um, which kind of creates a problem that we found out. Uh, but the idea behind VAMP was to hopefully capture this sort of thing where you are weighted um, looking at these gaps, right? Um, so looking at kind of early, like I just put up this decile signal plot. Um, if you read our report, you will see a lot more signal plots. Um, but this one kind of summarizes what we're talking about. 
about here. Uh, and we can already see here that VAMP has sort of what we're looking for on um, this kind of, instead of a, a strictly linear relationship, there's this kind of curve that you're seeing there, um, which more signifies that in the, the higher and lower deciles, you see a more, I guess, hopefully equivalent change in our VAMP corresponding to like these large tail sort of event price movements seen um, in the data. Um, and so finally our results. Uh, we split this up into two categories that we thought kind of made sense. So uh, I guess before we really talk about this, we kind of talk about like it's, un it's important to understand the motivation, right? Like we find here that VAMP does a really good job in what we call binary accuracy, which really is just you have two classes, price moves up or down, and we see how well do we predict this. When the price moves up or down, what percentage of the time are we getting it right? Um, but... I think it's also important to know that like sort of the motivation is if there is, I guess, for a combined model, what we would think would be best would be a combined model that for one is does really well in binary accuracy as we see, but also does well in over here, these two plots that you see on the right hand side um, are from a multi-class uh, Kind of classification problem where we're looking at one sigma events up and down so a good i guess price predictor would be one that i guess does really well on most of the time right uh, within those two one sigma events and then once it signals a large price movement coming it can switch and hopefully capture that event um but kind of spoiler alert i guess not very climactic but um vamp kind of performs well across the board. We, we thought precision was the best metric to look at specifically because this tells when your model is predicting a large movement, how often is it correct? We don't want to look at something like accuracy because you could have a model, in our case, Trade Imbalance did this, where it just predicted large one sigma moves way too often, right? So its accuracy was very, very good, but its precision, what we actually care about for the purpose of this project it's not very good um but i think it's still a cool result uh as you can see there even at the 60 second time frame uh vamp it has about 56 percent accuracy um in in all movements across the board uh which we thought was pretty good so um but yeah that's kind of the summing up that vamp is kind of king in in our analysis but we think there's some promise i guess moving forward um not only in more Bitcoin and understanding like maybe recent more crashes or something like that, but um, also expanding this to other crypto assets and other asset classes, I think would be really good um, analysis moving forward. But thank you. All right. So this was uh, Peyton's. Uh final presentation. Um, Peyton Martin, one of our, our uh, students from last year. So um, so here is here are the milestones and sort of the timeline for these financial engineering projects. In April, companies uh, pitch their projects to students. In May, students are assigned to projects and the project actually starts in earnest in August with um, monthly meetings with the sponsor and uh, weekly meetings with the, uh, the faculty advisor. Ultimately, in December, the students uh, give a final presentation, so a much longer version than uh, what you just saw here, and they uh, deliver a final report uh, to the sponsor. Now, I hope this was useful for you to understand uh, how financial data science projects work. Um, and if you're interested in participating in such a project, um, feel free to uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm at Sasha. I'm Sasha Stoikoff, and uh, or email me at sfs33 at cornell.edu, and uh, and I hope this uh, presentation has sparked some new ideas and new uh, projects that you may want to consider doing with our students.